And I'd like to thank you for joining us again. And we're going to introduce uh, Craig Kasmer, who is the park interpreter at Hartwick Pines State Park. So thank you for joining us, Craig. Hey, thanks, Jonathan, for having me. And thanks to everybody for, who's attending. Um, so today the program is Seeing the Forest and the Trees. And uh, by education, I'm a forester. Of course, now I'm a park interpreter. So I'm basically speaking for the things that cannot speak for themselves, which are trees. Um, so I do know a lot about trees. So this information I'm gonna be sharing with you this evening, basic tree stuff, like the parts of a tree, um, how trees grow, how to identify them. Then we'll move into some of the, uh, the forest type uh, topics such as harvesting and wood products and wildlife habitat enhancement, all those kinds of things. I'm gonna be switching between my PowerPoint as well as drawing on my dry erase board um, so that we can have some visual contact. Keep in mind, as Jonathan said, there is the chat room down there. I'm gonna be asking some questions and because I can't see you or hear you, um, there'll be four options, let's say, and if you think third option is the right answer, go ahead and put that into the chat box. Um, and then also, of course, any questions. We do have two polls, which we'll bring up as well. So I'm gonna share with the first screen. Of course, it's Hartwick Pine State Park, where I uh, work from. And let me get back to this one here. And so if you've not been to Hartwood Pines, or if you have, go ahead and put that in the chat. Yes, I've been there, or yes, I've heard of it at least. And so it's near the tip of the mitt of uh, Northern Lower Peninsula. Um, there is a yellow push pin there that shows where it's at. I do not actually work below a big giant yellow push pin. You won't see that if you come to visit me at Hartwood Pines. Um, but closer version or view of the park itself, it's a large rectangle, kind of looks like a a text box from a, a cartoon. And you can see the satellite image was taken in the springtime. And so all the green that you're seeing around there are mostly conifers. So your pines, your spruces, your firs, the evergreen, so to speak. A lot of this area, because it's in the springtime, have not leafed out yet. So our beaches and our maples and our aspen and our ash, also, um, some of the um, some of the the um, the other hardwood species are not leafed out yet, so we are surrounded at Harbor Pines, with lots of trees, um, lots of forest land. Very uh, happy to to be able to to say that. So, back in the chat box, I'm going to keep this slide on here. Trees need three major things to survive. I'm going to give you an option of four of them. Go ahead and chat the one you think doesn't belong out of these four options. The trees need water, they need nitrogen, they need sunlight, and they need nutrients. Which one of those don't they need as much of? And so hopefully you picked the second one in nitrogen. Now we need nitrogen, so do trees, but not as much as they need those three things, the water, the, um, the nutrients from the soil, as well as that sunlight. I'm gonna share a video with you and hopefully it, it comes through somewhat clear. This is a cedar swamp at Hartwood Pines I took this summer. We'll try sharing this with you and see how it goes. It's a short video. And what we see here is northern white cedar, some balsam fir. And if it's coming through, I'm gonna pan back over to the forest floor and what you can't probably make out but it's there, lots of ferns, lots of moss. The key element to that is that not every tree species needs the same amount of sunlight, nutrients, or water. There are some trees that require more water and can take more water. And so in a cedar swamp, called a swamp, um, we see that those trees can really handle having more water than maybe a jack pine forest, which doesn't really need a lot of water, very sandy soil in those types of forests. And that goes for our state tree. And I'll share that again with you. So our state tree, hopefully everybody knows what that is. And if you don't go ahead, or if you do go ahead and enter that into the, um, the chat room, if I can get it to advance. So this is a white pine, Eastern white pine, about two or three years old, comes up to about maybe about your shin. And it is shade tolerant at this age in its life. And if you can look far to the back 
the top of the screen up there, you'll see sun. Well, this tree, when it's young, doesn't need a lot of sunlight. But when it gets to be this age, like the one in the foreground, that's a 12 to 15 year old white pine. It's starting to need more and more sunlight. The tree in the far back reaching up to the sky, that's a mature white pine and it is gathering as much sunlight as it can. As it can. If it was growing in the understory or below the canopy level, it would be weak. Um, maybe you don't have enough ring growth to keep the, the trunk really strong. Um, and it definitely would not be photosynthesizing as much as it needs at that stage of its development. So I'm going to stop sharing here and we'll go to my dry erase board. So we talk about three major parts of a tree and these should be pretty elementary for everybody. But first we've got the earth, right? So the earth is right here. And what, of course, and you add, enter this into the chat room if you'd like. What are these down below the ground? We don't usually see a lot of these unless we're digging. Some pop up to the, to the surface of the topsoil. So those are the roots, right? Now, after that, we have the trunk. And if it's nice and straight, no defects, rises to the sky. We'll color that in quickly here. Then up on top, this is where all the magic happens in the tree's system. We call this the crown. And the crown, just like a king or queen wears on top of their head, it's very important. And so what happens is we start at the root system. There's rain that comes down, gets into the soil. And also the soil has nutrients. So that water is sucked up. It's like a, the trunk of a tree is like a straw. So when you're sucking up a beverage, that pressure brings it up all that water and all of the nutrients. So we got H2O over here and we've got nutrients that are going up the tree, up the trunk. Now, not only is that important for the root system to do that, but it's also an anchoring system. So that tree goes out, puts its roots out here, and when a gust of wind comes by, the tree can stand up instead of being toppled over. So the trunk is used for transporting those two things. We get to the top, and this is where, as I said, the magic happens. When the sunlight comes down and radiates on those leaves, at least from a, a hardwood tree or deciduous tree during the summertime, the photosynthesis that occurs within the leaves there produces sugar or energy. And then that in turn, there's a different color here, that in turn gets transported down the trunk in a reverse way and feeds the root system. So the root system is constantly growing, the trunk is constantly growing wood, and the top of the tree is making all that energy possible. So it's a constant motion during the growing season for trees to be able to put on wood, grow strong, grow healthy. Now, when one of the reasons I went into forestry is because I wanted to learn the names of trees. I think it's important. Um, certainly important if you're gonna be tapping maple trees to collect sap to make maple syrup. You don't wanna tap an oak, they don't have the sugar content. So you want to do uh, your research to find out what trees you're actually tapping. So back in the chat room, there are three major ways, so there's a whole bunch of ways, but I'm focusing on three major ways that you can identify a tree. I'm gonna add a fourth in there. You figure out which one does not work. So you can identify a tree by looking at the leaves. You can identify a tree by looking at the seeds. You can look at a tr identify a tree by looking at a type, and you can look at the bark of a tree. Which one of those do not fit? And Craig, as we wait there for just a second, letting your screen adjust there real quick, we're gonna kind of see, remember over in the chat, there's that button at the bottom there you can click and respond over in that side corner there. And we did have a question. Is there okay, a, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good. Have, you, have you ever done uh, maple syrup tapping yourself up in that area? Oh yeah, well, we, I do it at the park. We do it at Harwood Pines every year. We have a, a, a festival every year to, to, to tap those trees. We don't have a huge operation like some of my friends do up here where they, they tap like 2,500 trees. We tap about 13. We get enough sap for the day and for the event, and that's about it. But yeah, um, 
it's a, it's a, it's almost an, an annual rite of, of uh, living in Michigan. A lot of people do it just their home. They get their one quart and they're good. Good question. So the answer to that is the height. So the height of a tree is not a good identifier just because like if, a, if you look at a maple tree se a seedling this big, the leaves don't look like a true maple leaf like it's on the Canadian flag. Um, so height is not always the best way to identify a tree. The best ways are with the bark, right? So this is a red pine and red pine, you're gonna sneeze. Ah, oh, no I don't. Okay, I'm good. So the bark comes off the tree, but we don't peel the bark off the tree because it's, it's its skin. So trees are very much like us. They have skin, their bark, we have blood, they have sap. So bark you can use. You can use leaves to identify a tree. So this is um, an oak leaf, uh, a bunch that I found in my yard, red oak. These are also leaves too, but we call them needles, and we're much more familiar with that term, but this is from our white pine. And if you take a bundle of white pine needles and you spread them out, you can spell the word white, W-H-I-T-E. Now, keep in mind, if you're doing anything with science, you want to take a lot of samples because doing just one sample and saying this is what it is is not always correct. I've taken with tours that I've been given at Harvard Pines to school groups, and I found bundles of four. Now they're supposed to have five. I've also found bundles of six sometimes. So take several samples if you're doing a science project so you have the right information. These, or this is a cone of a white pine, and this is not the seed itself. The seeds are underneath these scales. But when I tell kids and adults they want to find a seed, this is a jar of white pine seeds. And I'll put some in my hand to bring the screen down so you can see how tiny these are. Okay. So they are super tiny. So looking for these seeds on the ground, it's kind of difficult. In fact, a lot of them get eaten or disappear in the, in the duff or in the soil. So an easier seed to find and depending where you're at, and we'll get to a next slide soon about that, depending where you're at, you can have different kinds of seeds that are heavier than those white pine seeds. So here I'll draw one, and of course, if I was to draw this to scale, it'd be this big, but you can't see that. So I'll draw this. Okay, so this is, if you know what it is, go ahead and put it in the chat box there. We would call that an acorn, right? And acorns come in various sizes, depending if they're white oaks or red oaks and the type of red oak or white oak there, but that's an acorn. Now, another one that I'm sure you guys have seen because it's our most common tree in Michigan, but you might not know the actual name of it. And if I was gonna draw this to scale, they'd be connected here. Just like this, there's two of them, a little stem that goes to the twig itself. But this comes from a maple tree and it is called a Samara. Now, most of us growing up called those helicopters or whirly gigs. They come from maple trees. And this is a wing. So they're wind dispersed. So when the wind comes up and, and they become ripe on the maple tree, they float down somewhere in the woods and they make a new tree. Acorns, on the other hand, they fall straight down. So how do acorns move about? Well, especially at my house and at Hartwood Pines, I have lots of squirrels and I watch them constantly grab an acorn in their mouth, bury it. So little known fact, 
that squirrels don't always remember where those seeds are buried. And so they may get buried in snow and you won't find them until next spring. Well, by that time they germinate and now you got little oak seedlings. So squirrels are a great value to us in that regard because they help propagate our oak trees and plant those seeds for us. Another way that seeds can move is if they are by a river system or by a lake, they could get dropped into the river and they'll float down and get lodged into the bank side. And now a new tree can form because of that. So that's, that's, um, that's all seed dispersal. Um, if they have uh, uh, pickers on them and they can lodge into the fur of an animal, the animal can just deposit those seeds elsewhere as well. So I'm gonna move to more about the entire state of Michigan and we will look at what's called the pre-settlement vegetation map. So, and there's a poll to see which tree you have near your house, if you have a tree near your house or apartment. So these, this map shows the upper peninsula and the lower peninsula and all the different kinds of colors there represent different forest types. And what's interesting from this, and you can't see those little rectangle boxes are color coded, but those all indicate different forest types. And what we see in Northern Michigan, a lot of is this light green and dark green, and that goes over to the Upper Peninsula as well. What we see in Southern Michigan is a lot of pink. Well, the pink down here is also the green up here in the sense that's generally a beech maple forest. But a lot of the pinks down here, the darker pinks, and even the lighter pinks are oak and hemlock forests. And so we don't have hemlock in Northern Michigan. Now you may find one or two of them, but not as a whole forest type. So when I've done school programs for kids living down there, they're telling me all about these huge seeds they find, whether it's a mockernut hickory or shagbark hickory or black walnut, they all have huge seeds. And those don't travel very far unless a squirrel takes them somewhere. Now, I'll stop sharing here. And, and Craig, we do have a that? question for you. Okay. And I'll go ahead and share our poll results with some of you folks as well in the meantime. But, uh, you know, you mentioned that there was a white pine had five needles. Is there any other trees that might have five needles as well? Not native to Michigan. Um, there are other kinds of trees that are found out west. Um, there's a three needle pine. And there's, um, I think, the western Western white pine has five needles as well. But yeah, just in Michigan, we only have five needles for white pine. Jack pine and red pine, which are a native pine species, they also um, have two needles per bundle. So it's pretty easy to, to, to determine that by looking at up close those, those uh, bundles of needles. Very good. All right. So you saw by those pictures, and that was pre-settlement. So that was before the Euro our European ancestors came here. Um, but Michigan right now has over 20 million acres of forest land, and that's considerable. That's a lot of forest land. They're all different ages of development. Um, but I'm going to go through something that may be new, may be new to you. Um, if you're doing charts or things like that at school, then you might or may have not heard of this, but it's called a pie chart. And basically, it's a circle. And each slice of pie, who doesn't like pie, you have a wedge that comes down. Now, 14% of Michigan's 20 plus million acres is owned by the U.S. government. 21% managed by the DNR. That's what this logo stands for. The rest of this is 65%. And we call that private land or family land. So maybe you or your friends or family have 50, 20, 10 acres, 100 acres somewhere. It's your logging, it's your hunting cabin. That would be privately owned. I don't have a right to go on that because I don't own that land. You do. Now, we know what the federal government owns. They own 14%. But who owns the Department of Natural Resource land? So I'll give you another question. You can add it into the chat. So I'll give you four options. 
One, all the doctors in the medical field in Michigan own the DNR land. Two, I own it all. Three, your relatives own it all. Or four, all of the above. And yes, it's all of the above. That is public land. It is our land. And that's why like right now it's deer season. And we have folks that are in the, in the woods hunting deer. We have to be respectful because everybody owns that. And so if you put up your blind next to somebody else, you're going to have to talk to that man or woman and say, hey, I was here first and whatever. So it's public land. We all own that. The difference is, is that foresters are hired by the state of Michigan, by the DNR, to, um, to manage it. So as an ex-forester, I would go in with my paint gun and I determine which trees might need to be cut down because of invasive species or because of the age of the forest or to regenerate certain species. So in the chat box, once again, just a question, a, a yes or a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, how many of you have used a wood product today? And I can guarantee you all have, whether you're sitting here right now at a table, or at a chair, um, or if you um, had written on some paper, that's a wood product. How about electricity? And this is the one I like the best. So if you turned on a light today, there's a good chance that you use the tree. Now, I'm not saying trees provide us with electricity. What I am saying is that the wires that go from your house to the utility pole that holds those wires, that goes to a generator and brings electricity to and from your house, are held up by a, by a tree, an old tree, a, a cut down log that, that the wires are hung to. So every time you use electricity, you're using a tree. So we use that all the time. So now, what is a good or a bad reason to cut down a tree? So let's use these options, go in the chat room for this. Uh, one, you want to increase wildlife benefit and habitat. Two, for forest products. Three, for the regeneration of younger trees. Or four, to put up a shopping mall. And of course, it's a shopping mall. We all like to shop, but you remove all those trees. Yes, you get wood products, but there's no more wildlife habitat. Um, I'm going to share a video with you right now of a friend of mine named Bill Cook, who is going to talk about the vehicles that are used during a harvest. If you've ever been to a harvest site, um, oh, this is, first of all, this is some of the forest types, forest harvests that are found, clear cutting, patchwork. Foresters go into deep science about this to make sure they're doing the right prescription for that forest type based on the tree species and the wildlife that's there. So here's, this is a rough grouse, and a rough grouse lives in an aspen forest. So it's colored just like the forest floor, so it blends in. The first, first couple years that these aspen are regenerating, and there's me in the middle, that's a young stand of aspen. These rough grouse go in there and lay their eggs and they feel safe because animals can't come in and eat the nest or eat the babies, right? So that's good. Next, when they get older to be this age, like teenagers, there are seeds that are formed on this tree called catkins. And the rough grouse like to eat those catkins. These trees regenerate by their root system, not by the seeds that are dropped, like oak trees and maple trees. And finally, when the trees get to be mature, these trees fall down, lay it on the ground, a male will come along, hop on that log, and use it as a drumming log. And it sounds something like this. Taps his wings right on that log, it attracts a female, and the whole process starts over again. So here, let's see Bill Cook. He's going to talk about a couple machines that are used in harvest operations. Well, hi, Craig and everybody else. Craig, I want to thank you for inviting me to talk today a little bit about those big trucks that we see in logging operations. Today, we're going to be looking at two pieces of equipment, part of a cut-length operation. Uh, behind me is a machine called a processor. It processes trees into log products and that's where a logger makes his money buying trees and selling log products you can see on this side is the business end 
of the processor, cutting head. We'll take a look at that in a little bit. It's called a cutting head because it's at the head and it does cutting. And over here on this side is the cabin and the engine for the machine. And the operator sits in that highly computerized cabin. There's lots of dials and what's it's and who's it's and joysticks and stuff like that. And what it does is it records how much of what kind of wood product in which species is cut. So at the end of the day, a logger knows exactly how much wood and what kind of wood he or she has cut. So let's take a look at that cutting head. Now here's the other machine of the pair that does most of the volume cutting in Michigan and the Lake States. It's called a forwarder. And a processor and a forwarder together is what we call a cut to length system. So the processor has already cut up a bunch of logs. It's recorded the number of sticks and the volume by each species. Now that wood needs to get out from where it was cut and left in small piles in the woods to a place called a landing where a semi truck can pick up different piles of wood that go to different mills. Well, we've looked at what we call a cut to length system, which is only one of many logging harvesting equipment systems that are available. We've looked at a processor, we've looked at a forwarder, but there are also those trucks, those uh, semi-trucks that pick up the wood that have specialized characteristics to them. There's also feller bunchers, which go up to a tree and grab it and cut it off on the bottom, grabs another tree, cuts it off and holds those two, grabs a third tree, cuts it off and holds those three until the bunch is full, and then it runs those trees to a place where they're cut up into round wood to length products. All right, <clears throat> we'll wrap things up here real quickly. Um, we talked about the other values of trees, and of course, wildlife is are some of those. So I'm going to share some some pictures of how trees are utilized um, by wildlife throughout the world, not just Michigan, of course. But these are trees that we'll find in Michigan. So this is a saw wet owl. It's in an aspen tree in a cavity. Its beak cannot make that hole, so it relies on woodpeckers to peck out some of that rotting wood inside of an old tree. And so it lays its eggs in there and nests in there, but it needs a woodpecker to do that. Woodpeckers in Michigan very rarely, if ever, nest in consecutive years in the same hole. Woodpeckers make a hole one year, the next year they find a new place. So they're always making new homes. Other animals that live in a hole in a tree made by a woodpecker will be our chickadees and our squirrels and our raccoons. Now when you cut down a tree, you've got the tops. So what do you do with the tops? You can't make a tree fort out of this. I mean, you want boards. So if you take all of these and clump them together, you call that a brush pile. And what lives below these brush piles are rabbits and mice. They love the safety and security of this brush pile. But when they keep moving in and out of that brush pile, they're going to create a scent. And once that scent is on the ground, you're going to have predators that will come to this brush pile. Things like badgers, bobcats, and red fox. And I've seen all of these species at Hartwick Pine State Park. Not all together, uh, just individually. And so finally, the last thing we have is this short video of a river system. This is the Asabo River in northern Michigan. And these trees are doing three things. These balsam fir are taking and the root system's holding the soil together so the soil doesn't go into the river, which is excellent. Helps the, um, the river stay clean and more gravelly. Secondly, the boughs or the, br the branches of those trees hang over the edge of the river and keep the river water cool. And a lot of fish that live in rivers, especially trout, like to have cool water streams. They don't want it to be too warm. And thirdly, those branches that are stretching out, insects may crawl onto those branches, make a fatal error, fall into the river, and then get eaten by the trout. So trees are a tremendous asset to our river systems in Michigan as well. 
All right. So with that, I think I'm out of time. I'll open it up for questions if anybody has any. All right. Thank you, Craig. We had a few questions that came through uh, kind of relating to your program, Forest and Trees. Um, so folks, I'd like to encourage you, you can stay for the next 15 minutes. We'll go through a little bit of a Q&A to cover some of those questions. Uh, but feel free, if you would like to leave, you can. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch it over from Spotlight from you there real quick, uh, just so everybody can see. And I'm also going to throw up a poll here. Uh, what is your favorite thing about a tree? So if you want to take a minute before you leave, go ahead and uh, go ahead and answer that portion of it and see what your answers are. And then I'll post those a little bit later. Uh, but one of our questions that we had coming in, Craig, um, you know, what do you call a baby bobcat? I believe it's a kitten. They got a kitten on there. Right. We're wondering that is what, what do you call that? And I, I know you kind of hit about some of the animals that are walking around in the forest in that area, especially going after those grouse. I guess you could call it a bobby cat. You know, that would kind of... <laughs> That's a pretty good one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question that we had, uh, do people who cut the trees down make sure that all animals living in the trees get out safely? Well, so what happens is when you bring those equipment in there and you start disturbing some of their habitat, those animals hear it and they move away. And it's the same thing that happens like with a fire, in a forest fire. The animals just don't sit there in the forest fire. They run away. Now, that happens every day when a tree falls and there's a nest inside of it or what have you. I mean, so, so there's always disturbance in a forest and disturbance for forests are a natural process. So a lot of times we as, as humans, we just help to, um, to excel that process. Um, I know that within the state, before there's a harvest on state land, you are consulting with the wildlife biologists to see if there are any threatened endangered species around, such as nesting ospreys or um, bald eagles, uh, if there's any sensitive uh, plant species. So all of those things are taken into consideration before just going in and said, let's, you know, let's get rid of this. One of the bigger things is, and I'm going to be doing a, another program on this, is the Kirtland's warbler, which was one of our rarest species of warblers in the United States and it requires young jack pine. Well when jack pine get old, the Kirtland's warbler don't use it, don't use it anymore. We clear cut those and then replant the jack pine so there's always good nesting habitat for that bird. Awesome, thank you Craig. Mm -hmm. A couple more here before we uh, end the program today. Somebody asked, what is your favorite tree? My favorite tree is the ginkgo. Now anybody that knows anything about trees, the ginkgo, there's a male and a female individual species. And the female tree produces a fruit that in the, in the fall smells absolutely terrible. Well, my favorite tree is the ginkgo because scientists have determined that if they, they found like mummified remains of dinosaurs, opened up their stomach contents and there were ginkgo leaves inside of that mummified dinosaur. So they are like one of the longest live oldest species of tree we have in, in Michigan, in the world. Awesome. There was another question in here uh, and maybe you can help me out with because I'm not familiar. Are Aspen native to Michigan or are they from the Mountain West? They are native to Michigan. It's one of the most common species in North America, not so much in Michigan because of the oaks and the hickories that are found in Southern Michigan. But yeah, those aspen trees, especially the ones that are found along the Canadian Rockies and the Continental Divide, that's considered to be one living species because all of the root system underground connect. So the one tree at the Southern end is kind of connected to the one way at the North end in northern Canada. So it's actually like one living clone, one living organism. That is awesome. Yeah, I had never heard about that part before. So I there's I keep every time I talk to you, I seem to learn more and more <laughs> and Good. different things. So Good. thank you very much, Craig, for uh being on here today and sharing a little bit about the forests and trees and such with us. 
And thank you to everyone who joined us today, uh, learning a little bit about the different uh, things about forests and trees and how they can help with us. There is another uh, slide I want to share with you here. You can learn more about what's going on uh, at the DNR and learning more about the nature around you by joining us on our michigan.gov nature at school page uh, or our nature at home page. So we have one for our school groups and we're doing live programs with them. Uh, nature at home are some pre-recorded activities and programs that you can learn more about your neighborhood and wildlife. But then you can also follow us along on MI Nature DNR on the Facebook page and keep up to date on some helpful things, maybe a good read about some nature topic or maybe uh, some new word that you might learn about our biomes or such that you might see. So <coughs> follow us on those pages. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Craig, for joining us and wish you all a good day.